Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. Coming up on the payoff. When you get sober or you try to get sober, you'll come across people who have what you want. And that's something we say in the rooms of recovery. And another thing we say is it's um, promotion by attraction, right? There's certain things you're drawn to when the fog starts to lift or maybe even before the fog lifts, something that makes you want to engage in sobriety. This person we talk with today, Erica, is one of those people. But it really is for anyone out there. There are so many life gems sprinkled throughout this conversation that anyone can use. I mean, this podcast is for people that are struggling with addiction or are in in sobriety or maybe people who are struggling with people who are (laughs) drinking and using. But this conversation really covers it all. And uh, even my man, Mike Hamilton, the producer said, she is full of hope. So without further ado... Let's get it over to Erica. But first, Kevin Souza. Hello there. <laughs> Erica, what's going on? Just trying to make a nickel. Trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, right? Exactly. Um, Mike is the guy you can hear chuckling, uh, the creepy guy in the background. He's the, pro- <laughs> he's the, he's our producer. Um, yeah. So nice. you, you were on a work meeting just now. Yep. I just finished up. What kind of business are you in? I am in the technology business okay. and I manage the geography of, um, accounts and salespeople. And, um, I have about a third of the state of Texas. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a big state, so you're in good shape. Yeah, I've been doing <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. That's, I love that's it. That's why you took care of my coffee the first time I met you. I mean, come you on. Know? Yeah. I'm a salesperson at heart. <laughs> One of the things that this is uh this whole thing is about this whole podcast is about I still feel weird saying the word podcast but one of the one of the reasons I want to talk to you and a lot of times people like you it's when people are like their their sobriety is attractive and they mean business I mean the first time I met you and I don't think that you can correct me if I'm wrong you run around banging big books over people's heads but you were sitting there reading AA literature um, 12-step literature and I was like wow this one means business yeah Yeah, you know, the big book is extremely important to me, and it's become more important to me in the last year. Um, Really, it's it's my manual for how to live. Um, Before I came into the program, the only manual I had was to take a drink or 12 to change the way I felt. And so when I got sober, I had to have a substitute, and really the big book is that for me. I just relate to everything in there. I, I feel like the stories, the examples they're all about me and so it's just extremely helpful for me and if I don't read it every single day it's like I forget it it's bizarre I can recite it but it doesn't sink in so you read it every single day I do I mean not the whole thing (laughs) so how (laughs) how much do you take in do you set aside is that part of a daily you know thing that you do it is yeah I get up every morning about an hour early and I have a routine that is also extremely important to my recovery, and that is spending time quietly reading. Um, and reading the big book is a, a part of it. I usually focus on the first part of the book where I'll either read the doctor's opinion or I'll read pages 84 through 86, or I'll read right now uh, Bill's story is really intriguing to me because I'm really fascinated with step one. And so since I started working with my new sponsor last, gosh, when was it? Last December, she's really having me learn the history of the book and learn what the author wants us to learn from what he's writing about. 
And so I'm really fascinated with step one. I think it's something I kind of skimmed over at the beginning. And so I'm circling back to that. So my routine is I'll sit down with a big book and I'll just let it soak in. And then I usually just write in a journal some thoughts or I'll just transcribe the reading exactly as it's written onto my journal so that I can remember it and apply it. And that's amazing. So you'll do that. It's almost like a form of studying to, to, write, to yeah. write it down because for me, to write is to remember. Totally for me, especially as I get older. <laughs> what, is it different being a woman with the, the big book? Because a lot of it I, is, is geared for, is from a male's perspective and it was written you know, in the mid-30s or late 30s. As, as, as a woman, is there a part that you, that you wrestle with there a little bit? Or is that one of those things where it's similar to religion where you got the gift of desperation, let's get off the debate squad and just get, in, get after it? No, for sure. I, I don't let that really bother me. I could get into it if I wanted to, but really when I read like the, um, to the wives chapter, I just felt so much sadness for what I had put my husband through. Um, I didn't, I don't really see it as a male, female thing. This is a disease that doesn't see sex. And so I just see myself as the sick alcoholic and my poor husband had to live with it. And, um, Thank God he didn't kick me out. And does he ever have to live with it today when you're like, when you're dry? Cause that's, I, that can happen <laughs> with me. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I can be a royal pain in the ass. And unfortunately for me, i I have a reprieve that's a, a daily reprieve and, and that rep- reprieve, I don't know if you know what the definition of reprieve is. But all that means is it's a punishment that's been canceled. And so if I get into the big book or if I work with my sponsor, if I work with a sponsee, that punishment is canceled for me. If I don't, I turn right back into the selfish, self-centered alcoholic that if you don't do it my way, when I want you to do it exactly the way I want you to do it, I will um, turn into, into a bitch. And, you know, that's, that's step three on pages 60 through 65. That has got me written all over it. It's funny how you embrace the punishment some days. I mean, you know, it's like you choose that rather than choosing, uh, you know, not to, not to battle. Oh, my gosh. It's, and it's like I'm having an out-of-body experience where I know what I'm doing, but I just can't stop myself. And I'll just continue to act like the selfish, self-centered person I was and can still be. Well, let's talk a little bit about the person you were. When's the first time, if you can remember, you had a, a mind-altering substance or, or alcohol when, when it changed the way you thought? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in ninth grade, so I guess that makes me 14 or 15, and I drank tequila. <laughs> of course I did, right? And it changed the way I felt, and I loved it, and I couldn't wait to get more. Uh, I grew up in an alcoholic home, so I had a lot of access to alcohol. I just never tried it until I was, whatever, 14 or 15 in ninth grade. And the moment you tried it, was was it something that dictated what you were going to do from that point forward, or was it, hey, I, I did this, that felt great? I heard a guy once describe it as it was just the most predictable thing in the world, and it made him feel good. Was it something like that you knew you could lean on and go back to at any time? Did you look forward to it? Oh, yeah, 100%. And I couldn't, I, I, from the minute I tasted it, I knew I was different too because I didn't react the same way my friends did. And I immediately found myself drinking alcoholically where I went and I, I stole that bottle of tequila that night and went into the closet and kept on drinking after everyone else had fallen asleep. And so I knew that if I wanted to, continue to feel that way I had to continue putting that substance in my body and I had so much insecurity and hated the person that I was I I became a a day drinker pretty quickly and hi so did you grow up in Colorado I think you're right did Uh uh-huh what what part of Colorado I grew up in Boulder, Colorado. Awesome. So, so it's pretty, pretty was- lab- liberal, laid back. A lot of real cool. I mean, I've, I lived in Colorado Springs and spent time in Colorado. And Boulder's a pretty cool place. It is. And my high school was two blocks from the University of Colorado campus. 
And so the party scene was a big part of my high school experience. And then I, um, I went to the University of Colorado. That's where I graduated. So we had a lot of fun. Did you have any older brothers or sisters? Mm-hmm. I'm the youngest of three. My brother's eight years older than me and my sister's four years older than me. Did they go to CU as well? Yep. My mom, my dad, my brother, my sister were all alone. So would, would they come down, like, would people, would their friends come to your house to hang out? Was there any of that? Like, was there any of, or would you have interaction with, you know, older people that were drinking a lot when you were a kid? The reason I ask is because this is exactly what happened to me. My brothers went to Villanova. We lived like a stone's throw from campus. And the the alcoholism, it was actually kind of a warm and fuzzy deal, but uh, there was a lot of access to alcohol, like you said. Yeah, and I, I would go up to campus. I was just in Boulder last weekend, and my daughter, my 21-year-old daughter, was asking me about it. And I would go up to campus during my lunch break. And there was a place called the Alfred Packer Grill where they served 3-2 beer. And I would go drink beer uh, over lunch. What's 3-2 three two, three two beer? What's that? 3.2? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so okay. it was a lower alcohol content that an 18-year-old could drink. No way. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so... You know, there were a lot of days I never made it back to school, but yeah, I, I mean, having the college kids right up the street made a huge difference. And I was an insecure girl that wanted attention from boys. And so to get attention from college aged boys was even more exciting. So you were going up there, you're hanging out and, and you're in high school. What happens? How, how does the alcoholism progress throughout high school? Um, well, it became a daily, a daily thing. And then it changed to different substances with drugs. And, um, I, like I told you before, I was never a normal drinker and my friends were always telling me to settle down and I could never be the designated driver. I was always off the hook. And then I started stealing alcohol from my parents. Um, and it wasn't even stealing because it was so available. I just took a 12 pack into my closet so I could have it at the ready if I ever needed it, which I did. And, um, to, to kind of sum it up, Pete, <laughs> you know, in high school, they would give these, um, awards like class clown or class couple or most athletic. Yeah. The, the award that I got was still partying at 50. <laughs> which which 50 was like you know 100 back then yeah uh, exactly yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that everybody thought was just the crazy party girl and and you go to CU that's a would you call it I mean it's a good school but it's a big school I mean people have a lot of fun at that school I, I balk at calling it a party school but that school's a lot of fun mm-hmm. yeah I barely got by uh, I, I passed all my classes. I, that was not my focus. My focus was to drink, to get drunk, to party, to have friends, and to really I couldn't wait to get out into the world so that I could work and move out from underneath my parents' thumb. Did you, live, in a, did you I, live at home when you were going to see you or did you live on campus? No, I lived on campus and in a house. I didn't really have a lot of parental control. I just felt like I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I just, I always, I'm the type of person, and I think this is a characteristic of my alcoholism is I'm always really racing to the next thing. And I couldn't just sit and enjoy where my feet were at the moment in my college age years. Um, I was like, I gotta get, I gotta get out. I gotta get a job. I can't wait to have an apartment. You know, I just always was racing to the next thing. And alcohol was my best friend. Was your, was your behavior, uh, like w- as a result of alcohol and other stuff, w- was that like something your parents noticed w- being right up the road or, or was it, did you live in a household where things were kind of loose and, and, and relaxed where nobody noticed? Oh no, they noticed. And I would always get, um, subtly shamed <laughs> by my parents. You know, I would, I would fall out of the car when my friends would drop me off and my dad would just look at me and shake his head and. My mom would give me the silent treatment and a guilt treatment. And, and finally, my brother, who was actually a big part of uh, me getting into recovery, 
was like, look, you have a serious problem. And I didn't disagree with them. I just had no idea how I was going to stop. And I wasn't interested. It hadn't gotten bad enough. But my family all knew that I had a problem. Um, they all drank alcoholically too, not, and but just not not as crazily as I did. We always say, I, or we, I, my brother Mike and I always say, because he's sober too, that you know, the guy, Steven Adler, the drummer got thrown out of Guns N' Roses. And it's like when I had a bunch of alcoholic friends, I came up from, I came, you know, from an alcoholic family and they were done with me. I mean, like, that's how bad it's like, geez, that's, that's pretty crazy. When you really look back and think about it now through that clear lens, like how mm -hmm. bad it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it didn't get to that point for me. Uh, my, my parents probably could have really used Al-Anon to learn how to set boundaries with me. But um, I, I finally did. I got sober soon enough where I didn't lose all of those relationships. How about that part uh, you mentioned where when I first drank, it was like a, it was like a gift. It was uh -huh. my first, it was my first spiritual experience when I first drank and I couldn't imagine going through life without it. And like you said, it had to get, for me, it had to get really bad. I didn't, it just wasn't an, it was never, it's scary to think that I had consequences early in my life and it was never even an option to stop. Yeah. You know, I remember very, very clearly a day when every time I took that first drink and now I'm talking about when I was in my thirties before I got sober. So I've been drinking 16, 17 years. And every time I took the first drink, my shoulders went down and I could, feel I could my breath settled down and I was like oh god there it is finally but then I'll, I'll never forget it the second through 12th beer I was I remember panicking because it wasn't working anymore and I was getting more upset and more anxious and that that calming feeling turned flipped on me it turned on me when did this and, happen did this uh, happen early in life or did this happen like like down the stretch no, no, this was right before I got sober. Gotcha. Uh, like in my 30s. And so I remember being really panicked, like, oh, shit. Now this is stopping working. The first drink, until I quit that first drink, I felt my shoulders go down. But then the others were more anxiety-causing than anything else. How was alcohol affecting your relationships, like with your family, with your friends, with, with guys? Mm, well, uh, I think what alcohol did to my relationships was make my relationships non-existent. Never did I have a relationship that was real and honest and healthy. It wasn't until I got sober and really a few years into my sobriety that I learned how to have a relationship. Um, my husband, I was married the time I got sober and my husband wrote me a letter that told me, you know, he and I read it every time I get my annual birthday chip. And he lines out. 15, by the way, you just had 15 years, right? I did. Yeah. Yep, so <laughs> Congratulations. I yeah. So, yeah. And, I, and I was lucky enough to see you read that letter. Yeah, you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So he wrote out everything that I did when I was drinking. And then he wrote out everything that he wanted me to do. And they're all things that as an alcoholic are just laughable things like drink beer, not hard alcohol, stop drinking after four drinks. Like these are things in the book that we just kind of laugh at in the meetings. Cause as an alcoholic, we, I drink until I can't drink anymore. And then he said at the end that if I refuse to get better, that something has to change and will it be, me or will it be something that he has to do, which was essentially, it was an ultimatum. He was going to leave if I didn't get my shit straight. And so um, my relationship, to go back to your question, with him was very strained because of my behavior. But at the same time, I was great at hiding my alcohol. I'll tell him things that I used to do. And he was like, really? You did that? I never knew you were drinking then. I would hide my alcohol with um, food coloring, and it looked like facial toner. I would put my alcohol in uh, little cups around the bushes around our house so I could go out and drink while the kids were out on their bikes. I mean, little things that 
were my coping mechanisms to make sure I could get enough to drink. And that was really my only relationship that I had was with alcohol. Everything else was just an impediment to me getting enough to drink. Now, you are drinking, I'm guessing, from, from what you told me, are you drinking towards the end? Is it is it like morning or, or, or afternoon? How, how is it like towards towards you getting sober and bottoming out? What, how, what's the drinking like? Mm. So uh, I work in my industry. I work with a bunch of guys, and we would start drinking at 2 in the afternoon. And we would go to ba- a bar and start drinking, and we would have customers come meet us. And then I would start uh, figuring out how I was going to stay out. And I started convincing the people I was drinking with to stay out with me. And I would get home. I would call my husband and say I had to be with a customer or else I was going to lose a deal. And, and all of that was not true. Um, and then I would stay out until three or four in the morning at other people's houses at who knows where I, I passed out in cars. I passed out in taxis, all sorts of things that, um, help me race to the bottom. Race and to the and bottom, then, yeah. and then I got so sick because my, my body was shutting down that, you know, I was drinking 18 beers a day and I was stick thin. You would think with all those calories, I would be pretty overweight. Was there any, was, was there any eating stuff like going on there? Or were you eating or were you not eating? Um, you know, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember that. Really, honestly, that's yeah. no one's ever asked me that. I don't really know. I think I was eating, uh, but I was just so sick. Like it was coming out. Everything was just coming out of me. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the end of my drinking was, you know, it started around two in the afternoon and I blacked out every time at the end where I, I would wake up and I wouldn't know how I got there. I would walk, I would pray that maybe my car wasn't um, damaged or that I hadn't hit someone. I mean, it was, it was not pretty. It is, it was ugly. By the grace of God, right? I mean, literally by the grace of God, you and I are talking to each other today. It is, I I got in an argument with somebody, it wasn't an argument. It was a conversation about the fact that I believe, Hey man, that's just my thing that we're miracles. I, I, I do believe that. And, uh, I think it's an amazing deal that um, that I'm alive today. When when you were reading that letter that your husband wrote, were you hungover? What kind of condition were you in? And and what did you feel when you read that part about you know something's going to change? Is it you or me? Mm-hmm. I I felt I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I was kind of like blah blah blah. Here we go again. Here we go. And then, and then when I looked at his eyes and he was waiting for me to, to make my, my next lie, I just got this fear like, oh my gosh, I think I'm going to lose everything. And so, you know, I, he had complained about my drinking before, but this was the only time, thank God, that it had gotten to the point that it, it had, it was a, there was a different level of seriousness to this letter and I knew he meant business. Um, and so I went to a therapist because I thought that would appease him. <laughs> so it was AA and, even on your, or, or, or 12 step no. programs? Wasn't even on your, no. No, not even on your radar? No, I had been to a couple AA meetings earlier in my life and they, I just was like, these people are weird. Yeah. And so I never went back. So I went to a therapist and I got to the point where she said, I'm not going to see you anymore. You are a chronic alcoholic and I'm not going to see you. You're lying to me. You need to go to an AA meeting. So I called my husband and I was expecting empathy. And uh, so I was expecting pity from him. I'm like, can you believe her? She said she wouldn't see me anymore unless I went to an AA meeting. And he said, Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, Actually, there's an AA meeting 15. I was standing (laughs) in the, the aisle of Walgreens. I'm not making this up. I was in a Walgreens and he's like, there's a meeting in 15 minutes at a church very close to you. Get to it. Now with the knowledge you have now, how did he have that information? Was he prepared? Was he, because a lot of times if we're trying to help someone, we'll talk to someone, right? That's sober or whatever. And we'll get, Hey, if that person tries to get squirrely or get out, hit him with this meeting. How did he know to do that? Yeah. Yeah. He had done research and he had talked with that therapist and they had developed this, this plan 
And, Those uh, bastards, right? I know, <laughs> trying, right? Trying to make me better. Those controlling <laughs> bastards. Um, but, you know, thank God I did. And, and I, I didn't want to go, and I sat in the back row, and I had my arms crossed, and I was sure that they were all making every – they were all so happy. And I just couldn't understand – why they thought I was actually going to buy this shit. And I just said, okay, I'm going to come to this until I can figure out how to drink normally. And then, you know, I met some of the ladies in the rooms and I uh, started taking, you know, step-by-step little suggestions. Um, There was one woman I called every single day uh, on my way home from work when I would be normally turning into the twin liquors or at the happy hour. And uh, she, she talked me off the ledge every (sighs) single day. And the most surprising part of that is that she didn't stay sober, but I did. And I always have a little bit of, um, sadness and, you know, like, why did I get this? And she didn't cause she saved my life. Yeah. Look, I have a similar story. I have, I have, uh, the guy who, there was a guy who told me that I needed to go to rehab when I was done. I mean, I was done. And uh, I was just meeting with this guy. He was my temporary sponsor. I was just meeting with him because I wanted to tell people I was trying to get sober so I can keep drinking, you know, just keeping up that yeah. smoke and mirrors. And the guy told me I needed to go to rehab. I went, my entire life changed. And, uh, you know, and this guy, from what I hear, can't get a day now. And I heard his health is bad. And I think the same thing. I'm like, wow, what a, what a miracle. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that, uh, or God's grace that I was able to get this. I want to go backwards a little bit. You said your brother uh, played mm-hmm. a role in your recovery as you got towards the, the bottom or, or, or played a role in your recovery. How did that go? Um, you know, that was timing also. My brother was always my, my uh, not my idol, that's too strong of a word, but my I looked up to my brother. I always wanted my brother's approval. He was eight years older than me. And um, I remember we had just finished at a Mexican food place in Austin, and I had had like three of the most enormous beers. And he was just telling me, you know, this is not normal. You have a problem, and you need to address it. And, again, it's kind of like when you scatter seeds along a path. I don't know why that one took root, but that's one conversation I remember. I remember, A, listening. And B, I remember it making an impact on me like, yeah, you know, that that's probably true. I think I do have a problem. And so um, my brother doesn't live near me, and um, but he's still someone, again, every year on my annual birthday, I call him and thank him for encouraging me in a brotherly, loving way to sit together and um he, I don't think he realizes what he did or what that those words meant, what they meant. But that was just one of those conversations I actually heard. One of mine was uh, my brother who was sober at the time. He kind of, I mean, my circle was so small. The intervention was like there were three of us at, at, uh-huh. by, by the time we got there. But it was my brother, my mom, and my dad. So I guess there were four of us. And he said, I don't want you to see, you know, his stepson. Uh, and, uh, I, he didn't even like his stepson at the time. He was having like such a hard time with him. And that hit me like a thunderbolt. I remember like, he didn't even like this kid. And I, he doesn't want me to see him. <laughs> and, uh, that was whatever gets you there. Uh, it's, yeah. so you mentioned you started to go to meetings. You're hanging out with, with some of the ladies there. What is, what's happening to you in those early stages of recovery? Hmm. Well, I had a, uh, and the book talks about this. You know, Bill, who was the founder of AA, had a what's called a burning bush spiritual experience. And I had one of those where uh, God made himself known to me and forever changed my life. Um, and so that was the biggest thing that happened. But if I wouldn't have gotten to AA, I wouldn't have had that burning bush. I firmly believe that. And, um, So I just kept going to these meetings every day at noon. And these ladies, they were just like me. You know, it wasn't like we were cut from any different cloth. I I could relate to them. We had similar interests. And I just just hung around with them. I almost kind of like wanted to sit next to them so I could catch some of what they had. 
And then, you know, I went to coffee with one and then she invited me to a big book study. And then we went to hear a speaker at a rehab. And um, those things coupled with the spiritual experience that I had is how my recovery really took off. How did you end up going, you may not remember this, but going to coffee with one of them? Because like, did you ask or did they ask you to go with them? So for some reason I was teachable and I would take suggestions. And this one girl, the one I told you I called every day, kept telling me I needed a sponsor. And I didn't want a sponsor. I to the steps. And I really didn't trust these women because I had some, uh, Hold on, so you, Erica, is, go back, because you, you, you broke up on me. You said you really didn't trust these women because? Well, I, I knew I was going to have to kind of tell my life story to them if I worked the steps, and I didn't want to uh, reveal some of the things that I had done and some of the things that had happened to me to anyone, let alone a woman in an AA meeting. So I was very reticent to get a sponsor. And so this woman kept saying, just get somebody temporarily. And I think it should be this lady. And so she recommended this woman. And so after a Sunday night meeting, I went up to her and begrudgingly said, hey, uh, can we get coffee? I, I think I want to start the set. And she was my sponsor for 15 years. Wow. How long did it take for you from when you walked in to when you asked, uh, asked her? About a month. And see, that's the reason I asked that question is because like this, it, that speaks, it's a microcosm of like the process that this is. Like if you could just mm -hmm. go and put your ass in a seat every day at noon for 30 days because your life is on fire in a bad way before you get there, it really is. It just takes, it all takes time. And it's like, don't, yeah. all the cliches, don't quit before the miracle happens or stick around long enough. Somebody will tell your story. That stuff's real. In my life, it, it, it has been. It is real. But I would also make it very clear that just going to meetings wasn't going to keep me sober. It does take time. But I would never want someone to think that meeting makers make it because I just don't think that's enough action. And, and some of the other, well, actually, before we get into some of the other action, I've, I've been thinking about asking you this. What are you telling people at work while this is going on? Um. I because because you're because you because you mentioned your job was at two o'clock. Yeah, we're at the bar. It's kind of like client maintenance. How did that yeah. play out? You know, I don't remember all all of it. I remember I just lied and said I couldn't go, and they all knew that I was leaving from twelve to one thirty every day. So I think people kind of caught on, and then they quit asking me. Um. I never told anyone I was in AA because I was very nervous about the backlash. And so it wasn't abnormal for us to be out of the office from 12 to 1.30 at lunch. <laughs> it was, just wasn't typical that it was to go to an AA meeting. But I think these people just saw that I changed. Did you ever, did you still go to those, did it take a little while to go to those, those engagements at 2.30 in the afternoon or 2 o'clock or did you mm -hmm. never go again or did you... How'd that work? Well, it took me it took me until I finished my fifth step, which took me six months to become willing to do a fourth and fifth step. And uh, that was about six months. So I didn't go back to any sort of social happy hour or any work function where there was alcohol until seven months sober. And that is huge. I mean, for me, I, I was institutionalized. I went to rehab and then I went to an extended care, a.k.a. like halfway house. for uh, That was, took up six months of my life, which looking back – is fine with me. At the time, it was like, eh, what's going on? And then I kind of caught this bug we're talking about here and, and started to really love recovery. And I don't know that I would have gotten sober had I been, you know, out in the world. As certainly if I was going to, because I, I know I wouldn't, because I tried to uh, get sober when I was young and then still hang out with people and go out where they're, I just wasn't, that's not my story. And other people, I know it's their story and it's kind of kick ass that they can do it that way. I wasn't like that. And uh, it sounds like maybe you weren't weren't either as far as socially going out. Now we can go. I, I, I can go anywhere. There's no place I can't go if I'm spiritually fit. It says it in the book, and I have lived and breathed that. There's now it's singleness of purpose, right? Why am I there? But there's no mm -hmm. place I can't go. Yeah, I I, I agree with you 100. percent And and actually, 
it makes me uncomfortable if people make a big deal out of it. And, oh, we're not going to drink. I'm like, you, you do what you can do, yeah. and I'll do what I can do. Just leave me alone. Uh, I'm fine. And, yes, I agree with you. And I do still have to check my motives. Why am I showing up at this place? Yeah, totally. And, yeah, but, no, you're right. How was, fitness is the key. How was your relationship with your husband changing as, as you got sober? And you're, so how many kids? You have two kids, right? I have three kids. Three kids, okay. And when I got sober, I had a six-month-old baby. Whoa. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Um, and so what's really interesting is that my husband started on a spiritual journey the same time I got on my recovery journey. It wasn't planned that way, but that's just what happened. And so I firmly believe that was God just taking care of him and making our, our marriage um, more protected. And so, you know, my husband is very supportive of my recovery. He quit drinking. He's a, a normie, if you will, and it didn't really bother him to quit drinking. But he did it to support me. And I don't think I could have done it stopped because if I had alcohol in the house, I would have drank it. Um, but part of my recovery and part of my living amends is to, you know, just be as selfless as I can with my husband. And so that helped our relationship get healed. Was this, was he ever conscious of, you know, you've got three kids, you have a six month old. Was he ever like, Hey, you're headed out to go to a meeting. We got this baby. Was there any, any ever that? Oh, yeah. At the beginning, I was very, very irritable. And the chaos of having three little kids under the age of six was really hard for me to be around. So I went to meetings every single day, sometimes twice a day. And he was very supportive of that because the alternative was for me to go back to the drink. And and that made me very uh, unavailable. Do you think that everybody has to get on board with the recovery? Everybody in the, in, in the household for it to work? No, I don't. I think it's an individual, individual story and everyone, it works differently for different people. How was it when, as, as you came down, down the, uh, the bottom of the rabbit hole, how the hell did you manage three kids and a six month old, uh, when you were, completely uh, would you I, I don't know that you would call yourself functional or I don't know what you would call it but I mean how the hell did you pull that off <laughs> it's funny I I wore it as a badge of courage I was like oh yeah I'm a high functioning alcoholic I, I knew I had a drinking problem but I was really proud of myself for how I could manage everything I, I was very very creative and regimented and so I couldn't wait to put them to bed until, and then I could really start my drinking, keeping in mind I had been drinking since early in the afternoon. I don't know how I pulled it off. I just, I just did. When you, you talked about action when you got sober, what was some of the action uh, that you took and that you still do today that you feel like kind of, I've heard somebody describe it once as recovery is like a spider web. And it all, it all comes together. It all kind of weaves through. What, what, what did you do? I mean, obviously, I love meetings, but, you know, you said meeting makers make it. Eh, but what did you do all, all together? Well, uh, I, had a, I had a formula or a recipe. I, I would get up, I would get ready for work, and then I would read something from a daily devotional that was recovery-based from Hazelden. And then, uh, you know, that was kind of how I started my day. That was my little insurance to get through till lunch when I went to an AA meeting from 12 to one. And then I always called my sponsor once a day to check in with her. That was a requirement. And then I would call it sister in sobriety, which was that woman I told you about. And then I worked the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, I prayed the third step prayer every day. I um, worked steps four and five. And then once I got through that, I got to work on my character defects. And so, you know, my character defects are very glaring when they're flared up. So then I got to call my sponsor and work on how to get rid of those. What I love about the, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is if you just do what's suggested, the shit works. 
and I just became teachable enough to do that. Now, I'm not perfect at it, but when I was new in sobriety, I was so desperate that I I just did what they told me to do. I like when you said the, the character defects. I got a buddy, Doug, uh, in our in our rooms that said uh, he didn't. He still has all his character defects. He just doesn't use them as much. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. I remember being so new in sobriety, and I had decided to work with this woman, and I just I didn't know how to live my day without alcohol. Like I, I was I was mystified like how am I going to do this and so I called her and I just said I, I don't know what to do I'm home and normally I'd be drinking and she'd say have you brushed your teeth yet today no okay go brush your teeth and call me back so I went and brushed my teeth and called her back and then she'd say have you eaten anything yet today no I mean Pete those are the kinds of things that my sponsor had to teach me to do and you know that selfless service that she did for me I mean imagine if you had to tell someone to brush their teeth and they call you right back I mean she gave me hours of her day to help me get sober and to figure out how to live life on life's terms rather than with a, a drink in my hand I was talking to a guy yesterday and he was a newcomer um and uh you know it was like off the wall stuff right exactly like I would would call somebody else about and there's a part of me, like the ego or, or irritability or whatever, the crap, that right away I'm like, oh, what are we doing here? And then I'm like, dude, this is exactly <laughs> what you would do. And I and I was like, and there were a hundred dudes who picked up the phone and would listen to you. I was like, you better buckle up and listen to what this guy has to say and share your experience. And yeah. I, when I got off the phone, of course, I felt incredible. Right. That's how it works. Yeah. So you continue to evolve. When when was when were some moments uh, that you were like, man, this is really starting to work? Was there any a couple you could circle, or where you're like, oh my gosh, like where you walk into a room that you were nervous to go into, and you end up having a great time? Like I think for me, those were like spiritual doors I would walk through that blazed the trail for me. Uh, that I just really made me come back. Mm. Uh, so I have a couple. Uh, one is an experience and then one is a practice. So I realized this thing would work when I had to go to Las Vegas for a work trip. And at a meeting, I was freaked out about it. And I, I had not traveled on a work trip, obviously. And I'm so I told the room, I said, I need ideas so I don't drink when I'm in Las Vegas. Because that was a place I would go and black out for days and do the things that I ended up having to put on my fifth step. Yeah. And, um, so a guy came up to me after the meeting and he said, okay, what you do is you go to the, the cocktail party or whatever it is, and you just get a drink that looks like a gin and tonic, but you just tell the bartender, just put soda water and a lime in it. So everyone thinks you're drinking, but you're not drinking and, and call somebody every single day. And when I, and I did that. And because I didn't want to face, why aren't you drinking? What do you mean you're not drinking? Come on, drink with us. And so doing that little action where I, I played like I was drinking, but it was club soda, and I called somebody every day in the program uh, was a moment in time when I, when I could really say, okay, this thing is working. I can actually live life without alcohol. Um, the other is a practice where when I learned how – to do the 11th step by um, journaling and writing. So the 11th step is thought through prayer and meditation to have a conscious contact with God. And I wasn't sure Saw how it's I was just so people do, don't sought through prayer and meditation to have a conscious contact with God, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so I wasn't sure how I was going to do that because my mind races like an F1 car around a track. But I learned a practice of journaling where I actually had a conversation with my higher power, which is God, and that was a game changer. So you would because, write. So you would write letters almost to God every day. Yep. Yep. How yep. how, how long would, how long are we talking letters? How long? However long I wanted. Okay. I started with a question. Usually it was, God, how am I going to um, get through this meeting today? And then He would write me an answer. You do your non-dominant hand for uh, 
for the God voice. And this is a whole practice. That wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> stop. Stop it. So you're, <laughs> so you write the question with your right hand and you answer with your, for me, I'm a right hander and you answer yes. with, with your left. Yeah. And when I see you next, I'll give you one of the flyers. It's from the Oxford group, which is how the um, AA got started. They have this, it's uh, listening to God practice. And you have a way to test and approve if it's true and if it's from God. And so if I started writing and journaling and then I thought, oh, I got to buy bread at the store, you don't let that derail your whole meditation. You just write it in the margin and then it takes the power out of it and you keep on with your letter. And sometimes I'll do it for 10 minutes. I still do it today. Sometimes I do it for an hour. My most peace my most peaceful days are when I'm spiritually fit after I've had really good time with God and he's just answered some questions. I can spend all day asking him questions, but until I slow down and listen for his direction, I'm still in self-will. So you'll take a beat after you write the, ask the question with your right hand and just take a beat and let God, the universe, yep. however people want to call it, you said God, I said God too, work through you. And and yep. then and then you write with your non dominant hand what, yep. what what God's response is to you. Yep. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it is uh it is a game changer. How often do you do that now? Every so often now? And you, you used to do it every day? Yeah, I used to do it every day. And then I so there's a couple things you do to test and approve if it's God's will or God's words and one is um, there's a list, and then the other is you share with someone else. So I would call my sponsor and share it with her. Now I don't do it that often. I do it probably three times a week, and I call my current sponsor and uh, leave it on her on her voicemail. <laughs> and she calls me back, <laughs> and she's like, yeah. she'll give you some Here's what I heard or this is what I've experienced. Okay. So what, what, a couple more. I'm not going to keep you for too much longer. Um, what, uh, what, what, what surprised you about getting getting sober? Like a like a positive. Uh, you know what? What surprised me is that life continued to happen, but I didn't have to drink over it. And so the program never promised me happiness, but it gives me these tools that I can use in any situation. If I have an employee that's going sideways or I have a kid who's become lost or whatever situation, I have these tools that I never imagined would be available to me. How and you, I never thought I would find it in AA. How, how, do, you, how do you quickly make the transition from, okay, I know this because I'm so familiar with the literature and, and I've lived it for 15 years to, to put it into layman's terms for one of your kids or your coworkers. Um, the easiest way to do that is how it was done for me, which is little one liner things like that's not a today problem yeah, or things like more will be revealed or, be right where your feet are or be, uh, I, I will never forget telling my kids this. there's a man who I think, you know, um, who taught me this where whenever you go into a meeting or a doctor's appointment or something you're nervous about, I sit in my car and I say, God, I need you to go on in ahead of me and set everything up exactly the way it's supposed to be. I'll be in, in a minute. And I, I taught my kids that before they had to do presentations. I just say, go outside in the hall and ask God to go in ahead and set everything up exactly the way it's supposed to be. You'll be in in a minute. And to this day, my kids are 21, 20, and 15, and they still do that. Even dropping them off at school, we're like, God, you go on ahead, set up the school day exactly the way it's supposed to be, and he'll be in in a minute. What an amazing legacy, right? That you hear from somebody else, uh, and, and and you're passing on to your kids. And and I'm sitting here thinking, shit, I wish I had that when I was so nervous to go into my first day of high school. Uh, you know, I was terrified. And uh, you, to to start to flex that muscle early on in life is pretty cool. And I do use that now. If I'm nervous, I did it before I did this with you. 
I, I just said, God, I'm going to need you to, you know, c- come along with me. I like that though. Go in before me. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that's a good one. What do you tell to people that are kind of on the fence when they show up? Uh, is there, uh, there's, and there's no magic bullet. What do you tell people? Man, that's, that's not a question I can answer really because everybody's on the fence about a different part of it. It depends if it's a spiritual problem or if they're just not done drinking. I can pretty much call that out pretty quick and I'm pretty hard on people that are just not done drinking. I'm like, don't, please don't waste your time or mine. Go finish drinking and call me when you're ready to, to look at this. Cause that frustrates me when people just keep on and I'm not judging them. I just, I just don't have time for it because there's other people that want my help. Um, if it's someone that comes in and is hesitant towards the spiritual nature of the program, I have a lot of compassion for that. And I, I try to give people a lot of room to figure out that higher power piece on their own. And it's sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And I just encourage people that, you know, you're loved here. You'll never be alone again. And we want you to figure this out at your pace. Where do you get the courage to say to somebody right away, hey, let's don't don't waste my time? And uh, because even to me, I don't love confrontation and I hear you say that and I'm like, ooh, like that's that's always hard to do. I find the strength to do it, but that's always hard for me to do. Where do you find it? I just I, I've gotten it over the years. It just happened to me last week. Uh, a girl called me and she was actively drinking and I just I I told her the best thing you could do is take a nap and call me when you aren't drunk. And she's like, well, can you come over right now? I said, no, I cannot. I won't come over if you're actively drinking. You're wasting my time. And I just think that's, that's speaking the truth in love. And if, if I know as the type of alcoholic that I am, Pete, I will run over people because I'm selfish and self-centered and I want to get my way. And if it wasn't until, and my current sponsor speaks the truth and love to me all the time, which I think I probably learned from her is like, you can't bullshit a bullshitter and no, I'm not going to fall for it. Sober up and call me when you're ready. I, I was in a meeting in your neck of the woods. Not, I think it was maybe last week or the week before. And, 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 a, and a guy I know you like a lot said he had a similar situation where a guy called him and was like, Hey, can you come? A guy was hung over or drunk or still drunk. And he was trying to, to cling on to, to recovery in some way. And he said, can you come take care of me? Right. And this guy, the sober guy was like, I swear if he had said anything else, but can you come take care of me? I would have gone, you know, but yeah. that's, not, that's not our job. And yeah. it, when somebody means, when somebody means business, the program is always there for them. I mean, it was for, right. and that's my experience. Uh, you know, with people, I got a buddy who always says this, you know, to a, to a newcomer, like if we were betting on you, we would not bet. We would, there's no way in hell we bet on you if, if you continue to drink. And he says, we would bet the farm on you if you stay sober and work a program. I mean, li- yeah. literally let, let, let it ride on the person who is going to embrace 12 steps in recovery and stay sober or, or just somebody, you know, again, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but my experience is the 12 steps work in it and uh, it, it changes lives. Mm-hmm. It does. And it changes lives for generations, which is one of the things that I've, I love and that I've seen in my own family. What is one of the most important things you do on a daily basis? Like if you could circle one thing, uh, 15 years sober, like something that you've, you've done every, every day. Cause you have that program that's real a- admirable and something that other people, you know, people want what you have. What is the, the, the one thing you do? Well, other than not pick up a drink <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm not saying that. Yeah, no, funny. That, that, that's real. Uh, the other is spending time with God in the morning. If I don't spend time with God in the morning, my day is significantly off kilter. All right. You've said it all. Anything, anything else you want to add? I don't think so. I so enjoyed our time together. It was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope we can get together and talk more about it. And I will share with you the Oxford group process for listening to God. Oh, Eric, I appreciate it. This will, and this will be up next Thursday, but I'll, I'll send you a link to it. 
Awesome. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Erica. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza. And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Network production. Thank you.